Hello and welcome to June's episode of Scotland Shop on the Sofa. This month we've been exploring all things Clan Armstrong and it's been a real treat to find out more about this fearsome Border Reaver clan. We've had lots of fun learning about Clan Armstrong, but sadly we're not experts as much as we wish we were. Please let us know if there's anything you think we've got wrong or if we've missed anything out. We would also love to hear from you if you have connections to Clan Armstrong. You can reach out to us in the comments or drop us a message and let us know what being part of the clan and sharing its heritage means to you. So let's get started right at the very beginning with the legendary tale that marks the start of Clan Armstrong. Over to you. The story goes that a fairbairn, an armour bearer to the King of Scotland, was riding into battle one day when the King was suddenly unseated and thrown from his horse. The fairbairn saw this and reacted heroically and he lifted the king back onto his horse using just one arm. Understandably, the king was deeply impressed and grateful, so much so that he thanked the fair baron by granting him lands on Liddlesdale and giving him the name of Armstrong to honour the great strength he had shown. And so, the great Armstrong name was born. This story really sets the tone for what was to come with the Armstrongs. As they went on to become a clan renowned for their vigour in battle, and their steely disposition. In 1528, the Armstrongs could assemble 3,000 armed horsemen ready to fight at extreme short notice, and they apparently inflicted more damage by foray and plundering than any other clan. Fighting was a skill instilled and nurtured from birth for Armstrong children. One of our favourite facts about the clan is that when a baby boy was christened, his right hand would be left out of the ceremony so he could grow up to strike unhallowed blows on anyone who crossed him. It's easy to see how they raised generations of such great warriors. I wonder, like, did they just like have a hand out? <laughs> like, out. Yeah. <laughs> like, just don't put any water on there. <laughs> this skill for combat was sorely needed as the Armstrong clan were border reavers who lived in the communities along the Anglo-Scottish border. This meant that they were used to, used to near constant turmoil as England and Scotland battled ferociously for control in an almost 300 year long war which spanned from the late 13th century up until the early 17th century. That must have been exhausting mm. <laughs> living in those times. More specifically, the parishes of Canonbay and Kirk Andrews changed hands frequently between the Scottish and English forming a 7,400 acre area that came to be known as the debatable land because no one could ever quite keep up with whether it belonged to England or Scotland from week to week. The Armstrongs lived in and around the debatable land, situated around 80 miles south of Edinburgh and 10 miles north of Carlisle. They used their formidable strength to gain power amongst this turbulent landscape, not only over the English, but also over opposing Scottish clans, because you know they love a battle. Yeah. <laughs> Consequently, they ruled the greater part of Liddysdale and later also took over Eskdale and Annandale. However, we don't want you to think of them only as heartless and cold warriors. Some of our favourite Armstrong tales show the great loyalty and care they held for each other within the clan. A great example of this is the tale of Kinmont Willie of Stark and Scott of the Clue, a pair who ended up impressing even Queen Elizabeth of England. A very unlikely and impressive feat. Kinmont Willie of Stark was widely respected and feared as an imposing weaver, who was infamous for crossing the border into England and raiding thousands of sheep and cattle at a time, bringing them home to feed his family and his clan. One day, however, his luck failed him, and he was unfairly caught by the English and imprisoned in Carlisle Castle, on what was supposed to be a tree of truth. A fellow weaver and Armstrong, Scott of Buccleuch, was outraged to hear this, and he immediately swore to rescue Willie. He led a daring and fearless mission and succeeded in breaking Willie free from the castle and bringing him home to Scotland. Supposedly, on hearing this bold escapade, Queen Elizabeth demanded to know how Buccleuch could have dared to invade her land and face her soldiers. He is said to have replied with the impressive tenacity expected of an Armstrong clan. What is it, madam, what a man dares not do? 
Despite herself, Elizabeth apparently could not help but be impressed by her enemy's courage and spirit. Another famous reaver was Johnny Armstrong of Gilnockie, who sadly had a more tragic end than the pair we just discussed. He was a notorious plunderer and raider, with an influence great enough to threaten even royalty. In 1530, King James V had grown tired of Armstrong's antics and ability to control the land around the borders. He felt that Armstrong's strength undermined his own power, and so he started to plot to get rid of him. King James invited Armstrong to meet, promising that he simply wanted a friendly visit and that he would have nothing to fear. Armstrong took him at his word and set out to meet him un unarmed. Sadly, however, he soon discovered that he had been tricked. King saw him as an irredeemable traitor and had never had any intention of simply talking with him. On Johnny's arrival, he immediately ordered his execution. Armstrong was horrified at this betrayal of trust as the Armstrongs valued honour above almost all else, but maintained his dignity and strength right until the end. He even managed to throw a cutting insult at the king as he endured his grisly fate, bitterly exclaiming that he had been a fool to seek grace in a graceless face. Armstrong's sorry tale has caught the imagination of numerous writers and poets and has been immortalised in many works, but perhaps most famously has been told in a ballad by the famous Sir Walter Scott. There are many other legendary stories about the Armstrong clan that have stood the test of time. One that particularly caught our imagination this month took place in the Forbidding Hermitage Castle, which is still standing today near Newcastleton in Roxburghshire, not far from where we are today. Yep. It is a grand and supposedly haunted ruin nestled in the hills above Langham that was supposedly built in 1240 by the Norman knight Nicholas de Soules. De Soules? De Soules, I think. De Soules. In an attempt to control the troublesome Armstrongs. By 1320, however, it was home to the man called William de Soules, a decidedly shaded character, even by the Reaver's standards. One day, de Soules concocted an evil plan to kidnap the prominent Armstrong maid. He acted quickly and snatched the woman, stealing her away from her home and fellow clan members. Once her family discovered she was missing, the Armstrongs acted with characteristically heroism and bravery and swiftly saved the woman, bringing her back home. The Armstrongs, however, were understandably furious and not happy to leave the situation at that. They captured and imprisoned de Soules, threatening to kill him. Interestingly though, Alexander Armstrong, the clan chief at the time, forbade them from doing this. He ordered that they release de Soules and allowed him to return home immediately. Unfortunately, this act of mercy was not repaid with kindness. After his release, de Soules invited Armstrong to Hermitage Castle under the guise of making peace but instead murdered him in cold blood. The legend goes that the Armstrong clan then captured the castle and boiled the Dussulis in molten lead. A grisly end, undeniably, but it's hard to feel much sympathy after hearing of his treacherous acts. A bit of karma maybe? Yeah, yeah absolutely. It is widely believed that Dussulis practiced dark art and a demon he conjured still haunts the castle to this day. Writer and historian Walter Elliot has been quoted saying that Hermitage Castle is an evil place. It feels evil. If you're feeling brave, you can visit, you can plan a visit to the castle today and discover the site of this gruesome tale for yourself. If the gore is all a bit too much for you though, there are plenty of other places you can visit that have fascinating links to the clan Armstrong and fewer demons and ghosts. I think we to add that one to the <laughs> list and go and give it a it try. It doesn't look that scary no. on the outside, but maybe at night. Yeah, I wouldn't be going no. at night, absolutely <laughs> not. One of our favourites is our castle of the month for June, Gilnockie Tower, which was built around 500 years ago, sometime between 1490 and 1520. It is thought to have been the home of Johnny Armstrong of Gilnockie, the infamous border reaver we discussed earlier in this episode. Gilnocky Tower was also supposedly used as a headquarters for reavers to meet and plan raids across the Anglo-Scottish border. It was the perfect place for this as from the top of the tower you can see for miles across the countryside into England. So any approaching rivals would have found it very difficult to avoid being detected. And the ever-present view of the enemy, la enemy land must have been an enticing temptation for the ferocious Armstrongs. 
It seems that the tower was built with battle in mind. It was constructed with limestone and sandstone, and the inner and outer walls have a cavity between them, which is filled with stone, rubble and wood. This may have been to provide insulation and protect from the biting Scottish cold, or it could have been a defensive measure to make the castle more resilient against rival cannon attacks. Can you imagine them like coming up with big cannons, like and just, just like attacking? Whoosh, yeah, it's quite pushing scary. up the hill. <laughs> However, Gilnocky Tower was not just a place for warfare. It had five floors, including a vaulted chamber, a banqueting hall, and a spiral staircase. It's very grand. Yeah, very fancy. <laughs> We find it fascinating to imagine the notorious Johnny Armstrong and his family living out their daily lives against such a regal and imposing backdrop. Quite nice living in a house with five floors. You get a lot of steps in. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> Though it was once a roofless ruin, the tower has recently been completely refurbished and is now open to visitors. The site also houses the Clan Armstrong Centre, which is home to countless reaving artefacts and the world's largest collection of Armstrong Archive. If you are interested in the notorious Border Weavers or the mighty Clan Armstrong, this is definitely not one to miss off your bucket list. Mm. Yeah. So far today, we've learned a lot about historic famous Armstrongs and their castles and territories along the wild border landscapes of ancient times. However, it seems clear to us that their bold and daring attitude has endured across many generations and seems ever present in more modern descendants of the Armstrong clan. Arguably, the most famous member of the Armstrong clan is Neil Armstrong, the first man to walk on the moon. Neil was born and raised in Ohio, USA, but was of German, Scottish and Scots-Irish descent. Quite a wee mix. Yeah. His passion and talent for aviation was obvious from a very, very early age. He became a licensed pilot on his 16th birthday, pretty impressive, yeah. and a naval air cadet at the age of 17. Most of us weren't even driving by then. Exactly. He went on to study aeronautical engineering at Purdue University in Indiana, but his studies were interrupted in 1950 by his service in the Korean War, during which he survived his plane being shot down. His brave conduct during this time reflects his links to the courageous Armstrong clan and he was awarded three air medals. I think to survive. I don't know, yeah. well, no wonder he wasn't scared to go to the moon. He finished his studies in 1955 and was employed as a research pilot by NASA. On the 16th of July 1969, Armstrong along with Edwin E. Aldrin Jr. and Michael Collins blasted off in the Apollo 11 vehicle towards the moon on his way to undertaking one of science's greatest feats. Just four days later at 10.56pm EDT on the 20th of July 1969, Armstrong stepped from the vehicle onto the moon's surface and spoke the now iconic words, that's one small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind. But it was also undeniably a gigantic leap for Clan Armstrong as in that moment they became the first clan to have made it into space. An enviable accolade. One of the reasons NASA chose Armstrong for the mission is said to have been his humble and modest nature, which was made evident by the fact that after Apollo 11, he shied away from being a public figure and dedicated himself mainly to more private academic work. However, he broke his usual customs to honour and embrace his Scottish ancestry and clan links when on the 11th of March 1972 he visited the small town of Langham, the traditional seat of the clan Armstrong. Didn't know that. I had no idea. And I've been through Langham quite a few <laughs> times. <laughs> like, do they have a statue or anything? I think there's photos and there's like pictures of them all standing, but I don't want a, a little plaque or something. I want a like, what do you know? Astro. A statue. Astronaut. Eddie Armstrong, the Langholm town clerk, had written to Neil during the Apollo 11 mission to invite him to become the town's first and only freeman. An honour similar to being had granted the keys of the city and the town received his acceptance with much excitement and enthusiasm. It seems that Neil himself also gained a great sense of community and belonging from the experience, calling the small town his home in the following touching quote. My pleasure is not just at the honour according me in this land of Johnny Gil of Gilnocky, but as the genuine feeling I have amongst those hills, and more particularly amongst these people. Thank you for this great honour. 
It is said that the most difficult place to be recognised is one's hometown, and I consider this now my hometown. We love to hear stories of people finding a sense of home by connecting with their heritage. Please let us know if you've had any similar experiences, whether with Clan Armstrong or any of the other Scottish clans we've explored over the years. Other modern day descendants of the Armstrong clan have achieved impressive physical feats closer to home. One notable example being Gary Armstrong OBE, who is a former Scotland international rugby player. His links to the clan seem to be reflected in his career as he played for the Border Reavers among other teams and was given the nickname Border Terrier. <laughs> it's quite a little name for a big band. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was thinking, how odd. He seemed to have inherited the fearless nature of early warrior, warriors like Buclew, as in Johnny Wilkinson's book How to Play Rugby My Way. Wilkinson refers to Armstrong as the scrapyard dog. It's a little bit better than Border Terrier. He's a bit angry though, you know, yeah. like terriers are pretty aggressive. Saying that he had never met anyone as tough as him. Armstrong captain Scotland to victory in the 1999 Five Nations and has received many accolades for his career, including an OBE in the 2000 in the 2000s New Year Honours. It is, a de it is definitely poignant to see descendants of the clan achieving such great success in the same territories they ruled over so many centuries ago. It's clear to see that the Armstrong traits of daring, strength and achievement are deeply rooted and ever present. If you're lucky enough to have Armstrong blood, I hope you feel inspired having heard just about some of the great accomplishments of your peers. We could talk about the Armstrongs all day, but sadly we're running out of time in this episode. Before we go though, we need to tell you a little bit about our favourite thing here at Scotland Shop. Tartan. Of course. Yes. <laughs> the Armstrongs have two variations um, of tartan. So they have um, Armstrong Ancient, which is this one here, and the Modern Tartan. The Modern Tartan is a deep green colour, um, interspread with navy squares with a bold red lining run through. And the ancient tartan is made up of softer colours, being mostly a sort of mossy green with a gentle sky blue squares accented with the red muted stripes. Which I quite like these Yeah, ones. I quite like yeah, the ancient. Very yeah. subtle. We have many items you can choose from, from flat caps to kilts to brogues. So you're sure to find the perfect piece to help you connect with your past. We hope you've enjoyed this whistle stop tour through the history of Clan Armstrong. There's so much more we could have shared, but it's impossible to fit it all in. If you'd like to find out even more about the clan, please do pay a visit to the newly updated clan page on our website, as well as our blog posts. You can also test your knowledge on all things Armstrong with our quiz. To stay updated on all our clan content, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, email newsletter, and social media.